Hey everyone, this is Andrew Case over here at Working for the Word. And this music that you're hearing right now, you're probably wondering, what in the world does this have to do with Bible translation? We're going to get into that. When Super Mario Brothers was released a year after I was born in 1983, it was the beginning of a major revolution in the culture of the world and the first step in what would become a multi-billion dollar empire. It also began to change the way we think about education and even business and this whole idea of gamification in all different areas of life. At the very least, what it did was it proved that games have the ability to really capture people's attention for long periods of time. They have the ability to captivate people and draw them in to different worlds and immerse them in those worlds. So what does all this have to do with Bible translation? Well, hang with me and we'll get there. But what I have to talk about first is a problem. And this has been a challenge for the church for as long as we can remember. And that challenge is, how can we get back into the skin of the original hearers? How can we get back into their situation and understand the scriptures from their perspective as they would have heard it? This is a challenge not only for Bible translators, but also for teachers of the Bible, pastors and leaders. If they want to be truly responsible in how they teach the Bible, they have to spend and dedicate a lot of time to getting people to understand the Bible in its original context and how the original hearers would have understood it and how it would have impacted their lives. Now, when we talk about this, it brings us into this whole area of translation theory called relevance theory. And relevance theory is basically a theory that aims to explain the well-recognized fact that communicators usually convey much more information with their utterances than what's contained in their literal sense. And so there's all kinds of things going on in our what they call our cognitive environment that trigger a fuller understanding of what is being said. So just a simple example. Let's say that one day Peter says to Mary, did you enjoy your skiing holiday? And Mary looks at him and says, have you seen the cast on my leg? So that interchange assumes several things. Her answer, so it assumes that her answer is actually answering his question in a relevant way. So the hearer has to understand several things. First of all, what is skiing? And does skiing involve risk and danger to your leg? And then what is a cast? You know, what, why do you put a cast on somebody's leg? Well, all of these things, there's, there's a lot more we can talk about. But they're part of our cognitive environment because we actually understand the concept of skiing. We have all of these associations already in our minds so that we can immediately understand the relevance of her response. Now, when you think about it and break it down, this is actually a rather complex response to a very simple question that's a yes or no question, right? She could have said yes or no to did you enjoy your skiing holiday? But no, she didn't. And this is actually very common in real life. We like to play with cognitive environments and implications and rhetorical questions and all of that. And so she responds to the rhetorical question and assumes that you understand that a cast on her leg means, no, I didn't enjoy my vacation because I had an accident. Now, let's imagine that you're from 3,000 years ago and you have never seen skis You've never seen a movie with someone skiing. You've never had that experience yourself, obviously. And maybe you've never even seen snow. And you've also never seen somebody's leg in a cast. So is any of that discussion going to make sense? You're going to have to unwrap and unpack all of the details around it, which is what we call the cognitive environment, so that that discussion becomes relevant in your mind. So imagine how much of that is going on in the Bible. Tons of it. Now, if someone doesn't unpack that for you, you're an ancient person and you've traveled to the future, you might start inserting your own relevant categories that are similar. 
from your own cognitive inventory. So maybe this cast on the person's leg looks like the result of some kind of religious ceremony or rite. So maybe you would assume that they did have a good vacation because they did this thing to dedicate themselves to the gods. It's a silly example, I know, and it sounds silly, but you get the point, you get the picture. So getting back to our original challenge we're talking about, getting people to understand the cognitive environment of the scriptures, of an ancient world, well, we have several options. So you can have study Bibles that talk about and describe in detailed language these different issues and and help you try to visualize those worlds through descriptions. So that's one option. Then we've got another option. People go to the Holy Land. People go to Israel. So they want to experience and be immersed in the world of the Bible where it took place. And they go on these trips and these tours and everything. And they can approximate some of it, especially when they go to Old Testament sites, at least see more or less what the land looks like. But there's no way they can actually fully experience an immersive ancient world because, you know, when you go to Israel, you're actually in the middle of a very modern European looking world at the end of the day. So that's kind of shattered by globalization and how modernized Israel looks today. And so a lot of people like me end up being a little disillusioned when they go there and they're expecting to feel like they're in the land of the Bible, right? They're, you want to see camels everywhere and everyone's wearing robes and uh, no electric lines and no glowing billboards and that kind of stuff, but it, it's actually not that way. It's very modern. So what else can you do? Well, there are a lot of movies that have come out that have used special effects to recreate a lot of these worlds, right? But a lot of them, like Ridley Scott's Exodus movie, Gods and Kings, are just Horrible, horrible, just blasphemous reinterpretations of of the Bible, of the biblical stories. But there's little clips here and there where you're like, oh, that's that's really neat. I feel like I'm in Egypt. It's really cool to see it come to life in that way and seem like an immersive world. But usually those things are few and far between in the movies because you're so focused on and distracted by other things going on. They're Their goal isn't really to make you feel like you live there. You can't linger in somebody's kitchen and look at everything there that they use and how they cook. You can't wander into one of the temples and explore and just sit there and linger there and feel what it's like to be an average Egyptian going to the temple. You can't do that in a movie. So another option is you can go to a museum or you can read a book on ancient iconography or archaeology. So, for instance, I've recommended on this podcast before Othmar Kiel's book, The Symbolism of the Biblical World, Ancient Iconography in the Psalms, which is great, but it's a very technical volume that most people are never going to pick up, most people have never heard of. And you can only go so far by looking at black and white sketches of ancient iconography, right? That's not exactly something that you can use with your kids very easily or find yourself totally immersed in for hours and feel like you walk away feeling like you've been there and lived in that world. And the same with a museum. Museum is cool because you can feel some of the weight of the reality of physical objects. You can see and feel small next to these massive statues and monuments. My wife and I went to the British Museum recently, and yeah, there's astonishing things in there. But at the end of the day, you don't really feel like you've lingered in the normal daily life of someone from the ancient world. You've seen some of the highlights, and a lot of them very worn out, but it's not really in context. It's in this big museum in London, and then there's a gift shop, and then there's a bunch of people walking around in very modern clothes, and it really shatters the whole immersive experience in that sense. So what I'm getting at is that the challenge that we're facing, that we've faced for a long time of 
getting people to expand their cognitive environment to really understand the nuances of Scripture as if they were original readers or hearers, well, we've got a long way to go. It's hard. It's hard to bridge that gap. And so many of these options fall short at the end of the day. So I discovered something recently that is absolutely a game changer. And I say that as a pun intended, a game changer for this whole challenge. And what I'm talking about are two new video games that came out within the last three years. One is called Assassin's Creed Origins, and the other one is called Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Now, I am not a gamer by any stretch of the imagination, and I will be the first to admit that there is a rift, a large rift, I think, between the world of scholars and the world of gamers. The world of scholars typically looks at the world of gamers askance, you know, with suspicion and as though this were the biggest waste of time. And they're just, you know, typically looking at it as, wow, what a tragedy that so many people are wasting their lives away, investing thousands of hours in something that doesn't exist. And I think it would be fair to say that a lot of gamers would not gravitate toward the scholarly community. Both communities essentially live literally in different worlds because the gamers have invested in an alternate reality or several different realities that they spend hours and hours of their day in. And they really only want to talk to, naturally, they only want to talk to people who understand and have lived in those realities. So what I guess what I'm saying is, I'm not surprised that I have not heard from anybody in my circle of, you know, the scholarly community and Bible translators about these games. No one has reached out to me or shared on Facebook or anything about these games. But I honestly think these games are an amazing, amazing key and tool for bridging this gap of cognitive environment disconnect between the biblical world, the ancient world, and our world. I think that God in his providence has had these video game, massive video game designers invest millions upon millions of dollars in recreating these worlds in their video game to such an amazing point of accuracy so that we as the church can benefit from it. So let's talk about these games and then let's talk about how we can use them and how I'm going to be using them in Bible translation. So Assassin's Creed Origins is an action-adventure video game developed by Ubisoft Montreal. And it's the 10th major installment in this whole series called Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed Origins is set in the ancient world of Egypt in the Ptolemaic period. So it's not exactly as far back as the Israelites being in Egypt, but it's a lot closer than it is now. Let me tell you that. And what these video game developers have done is nothing short of a spectacular achievement in visual recreation of this world. It is expansive. It is something you can explore for days. It has an incredible amount of attention to detail. And it is a lush and beautiful environment. Now, for those of you who are not gamers and have no idea how the world of gaming has advanced, and you're still stuck thinking about Mario Brothers or Age of Empires or something, let me tell you, we are in a different age of gaming right now. The kind of amazing, realistic graphics that are available at your fingertips is just stunning, jaw-dropping. And now more than ever, you have a reason to look into this and investigate it for yourself. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, okay, so they made this world, but how realistic could it be? They're just a bunch of game designers. What would they know about making ancient Egypt realistic? Well, they took it seriously. They worked with Egyptologists and people from the British Museum to make this world and reconstruct it in the most believable way possible. They wanted it to be so historically accurate that it could actually be used in schools, in education. So 
they actually created this whole, what they call a discovery tour part of the game. So you're not going through and killing people and fighting and seeing blood splatter everywhere. What you're doing is you're calmly exploring the world. You have free reign to explore the world as a woman, as a man, as a child. You can explore the world as an eagle from an eagle's point of view, flying all over the place. And you can ride camels and horses and donkeys. And along the way, there are these little points that will stop you and they will narrate to you some of the history of that location or that area and immerse you in the history step by step by step as you explore. It's absolutely astonishing. The textures, the lighting that you see, the amount of information that's embedded in this discovery tour mode is absolutely amazing. Now, you can go on YouTube. You don't have to buy the game. You can go on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description, and watch the entire walkthrough of the tour. And I don't even know if you can do it all in 11 hours. There's one video that's 11 hours long. So you just got to experience and see this for yourself and watch it on a monitor that's full HD. You get the crisp, high definition, and it'll be worth it, I promise. Now, while the video tours give you an idea of what is available, if you actually own the game, then you can linger in homes. You can explore rich people's homes. You can go into poor people's homes. You can sail a boat down the Nile for miles and miles. You can explore the pyramids. You can go into the library of Alexandria and explore it and see the scrolls and the scribes and people in there. There are people all around doing their jobs in their normal dress. It's absolutely incredible. So when my wife and I discovered this, we said, oh man, we've got to use this to teach biblical Hebrew because now you can take people in this immersive environment and use communicative biblical Hebrew as you're there in the environment. How awesome would that be? You know, you could point to different things instead of showing old pictures of them or or clips from some cheesy Bible movie that was made back in the 80s on a low budget. You can really linger there and help people understand this world in Hebrew. How cool would that be? You can walk into a temple and experience what it's like to be in an Egyptian temple and see people worshiping and hear them speaking in Greek because it's the Ptolemaic period, right? Now, as if that weren't enough already, this same company published Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is the last installment they've had in this series, and it's set in the years 431 to 422 B.C., and so it's all set in Athens, Sparta, and you get this immersive, incredibly beautiful experience in ancient Greece. Now, I'm going to link it in the description below. They did the same thing. There's a discovery tour that you can take and just learn incredible amounts. It's like a living, breathing museum that you're walking through, and everything is true to life as extremely historically accurate as possible. And so, where are we going with this? Well, obviously, this one set in Athens would be perfect. Perfect for people teaching communicative biblical Greek. In the same way I mentioned about Hebrew. And just imagine YouTube being filled with people walking through these worlds and talking about them, helping people learn biblical Greek by walking them through these worlds. So that's that's the kind of immersive experience that you and I learned language in, right? Uh, our parents taking us throughout the world and naming things and hearing people talk about them. And we slowly but surely started to grasp the sound, the pronunciation, and the meaning in the language. These developers not only did this entire Discovery Tour version of their game in English, but they also did it in Spanish. I don't know how many other languages they've done it in, but you can get the Spanish version. There are Spanish ones on, on YouTube. So I've given the entire Discovery Tour of the Ancient Egypt one to 
the translation team that I'm working with here in Mexico. I said, here you go. Work your way through this little by little, little bit every day, so you can start getting immersed in this ancient world, feeling like you've lived there. And that will start to change the way you read the Bible, I guarantee it. Because this is not a touch-and-go experience like so many things are in church and theological education and books. This is an immersive experience that it can totally help reprogram your mental map. Everybody has a mental map or preconceived cognitive environment that we've filled in on our own about the ancient world. We all have been forced for years to just sort of imagine it in our own way, with our own limited knowledge. And often those imaginations that we have are so corrupted by our modern presuppositions that they really aren't helpful. I don't know if I've told this story already, but my pastoral ministry professor, he actually had this happen to him. After preaching on Sunday morning, a lady came up to him, a sweet old lady came up to him and said, Oh, pastor, I really love how you preach, but it would be so much better if you wore a tie in the pulpit. And so he said, why? And she said, totally straight-faced, well, because Jesus wore a tie. So that may sound like a silly, extreme example, but I think you get the idea. We, so many times, make assumptions about how things must have been. Another example is we really have not Most of us have not lived in a context where there are temples and shrines around every corner, where you can see different idols and different offerings being offered all the time and people worshiping there constantly. We do not live in that world, most of us. So in conclusion, basically, I am just incredibly thankful that this tool is out there and available, and I want more people to know about it so that they can start using it in creative ways. You know, The ones that I've talked about are just the tip of the iceberg of how people could use this. Um, Sunday school, in Sunday school with kids, you know, it'd be so great if kids could grow up having their mental map programmed in this way to be able to understand the Bible. So when they think of the ancient world, they think, oh, I've actually spent hours exploring this place. I, I know what these people how they lived, what it was like for them in so many ways. So I've been sharing this with consultants and Bible teachers, Hebrew teachers all over the place, and I would encourage you to do the same and check it out for yourself. Now, right now, I think it's still on sale for like 80% off for the Origins one, and then the Odyssey one is like 65% off. Like, I bought them both, And I didn't spend more than $40. So really affordable right now. I think it was actually around $12 for the ancient Egypt one. So I don't know if that sale's still on. You could go check it out. Uh, Super worth it. Of course, you've got to have a PC. You've got to do the research to find a PC or a game platform that can actually run it at uh, a nice resolution and clarity and smoothness. But I would love to see somebody on YouTube do a walkthrough, you know, screen record, do a walkthrough. Somebody who studied a lot of the worldview of the ancient Near East and just walk through and be a guide to show how this connects with the Bible in different ways and help explain how people thought back then and all of that. So you can do that under the fair use policy of YouTube. You can do screen captures, and as long as you're doing your own different narration that's different from just posting the game as it is, that falls under the fair use policy of YouTube, and you can post that without any copyright violations. This is how gamers all around the world make millions of dollars just by posting their gaming experience on YouTube and they get millions of views and they're millionaires because of it. So how cool would it be if Christians started doing the same thing with these resources, walking through and saying, okay, here's how we can connect this with scripture and here's how this helps us understand this passage better. That would be awesome. So that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening. 
If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others who might find it interesting and edifying. And leaving a review helps out a lot too. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.